Good, morning, uh, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for coming. So as a student who is interested in the history of science, medicine, and the field of bioethics, I am drawn to topics and questions that address the role of science and medicine in affecting societies. The Samuel George Morton Cranial Collection, also known as the Morton Collection, is one such case that connects issues surrounding colonial legacies, race science, medical education, and a range of inherited ethical dilemmas. As such, it is a highly suitable as well as timely case study to better understand some of the ethical issues of human remains more broadly. In my process of trying to analyze the Morton Collection, I have found that legal history and modern principles of research ethics can be a useful framework to engage with the ethical challenges at hand. This research project is an independent study that seeks to explore the treatment of human remains through the Morton Collection and reflect on how its history and usage have engaged with certain principles that have been encoded into American laws and modern bioethical standards. To give some context on the Morton Collection for my discussion, I will provide a brief overview of Samuel George Morton and the history of his human remains collection. The term human remains is how this issue is often discussed, and so this is the term I will be using for today. But I wanted to highlight that some communities more commonly use the term ancestors now. So, the Morton Collection is a collection of human skulls that was, uh, was amassed by Samuel George Morton in the 1830s and 1840s. The Penn Museum has been in possession of the Morton Collection since they acquired it in 1966. Morton was a Philadelphia-based physician and a Penn Medicine graduate who was fascinated by the relationship between science and race. In pursuit of this research interest, he collected hundreds of skulls to compare anatomical traits between racial groups. Morton was by no means the only physician in America, or even Philadelphia, collecting bodies and remains on a large scale for research. However, he eventually became the most prolific, and the Morton Collection became the largest collection of its kind in the world at the time. When he died in 1851, Morton had acquired over 900 skulls for his collection. Within his cranial collection were the remains of several enslaved or formerly enslaved individuals, uh, demonstrating the connection between the Morton Collection and the colonial institution of slavery. Morton's theories, philosophies, and research objectives are in line with what we would call today white supremacist thought. His work to establish an anatomical basis for a racial hierarchy contributed to the justification and legitimization of slavery, which at the time of his collecting remained legal in parts of the United States. While the Morton Collection features remains from Caribbean islands as well, my discussion today will be focusing on remains collected in 19th century Philadelphia. As Dr. Paul Wolf Mitchell has characterized it, Philadelphia in this era was considered the American city of medicine due to a high density of medical education institutions such as Penn. This compounded with a unique legal environment to make Philadelphia a focal point for grave robbing or body snatching, a prominent way that physicians like Morton were able to collect human remains. And so, this brings me to a discussion of some of the legal considerations connected to the Morton Collection and its historical context. My research process included a review of legal scholarship and historical court cases addressing the issue of human remains and the notion of rights of the body after death. The most prominent principle that I noticed was the idea of dignity in death. Dignity can be understood in basic terms as being worthy of or treated with respect. In today's American legal system, the principle of dignity and the notion of desecration, uh, desecration sorry, are integrally tied together. We can understand desecration as demeaning or disrespectful acts against graves, tombstones, and human remains. There are several laws in place today that protect graves and human remains from desecration, also referred to as undignified disturbance. According to legal scholar and professor Fred O. Smith from Emory Law School, Legal protections against undignified disturbance are designed to protect the dignity of the deceased. In light of this, the history of remains acquisitions for the Morton Collection seem to transgress against the principle of dignity. It should be noted that many of the remains in the Morton Collection were taken from a potter's field, a place to bury unknown or unclaimed people, which now today is Franklin Field. The people buried in the potter's field were disproportionately vulnerable groups, such as those of low socioeconomic status, or black formerly enslaved individuals. Given this, I ask the question, at what point is the removal and continued housing of remains considered acceptable versus desecration? Who has decided which bodies are sacred and untouchable versus disposable? Overwhelmingly in the history of Philadelphia, these decision makers were wealthy white professionals. Um, grave robbing in Philadelphia continued without challenge for longer than neighboring states, uh, in part because of the political power of physicians and medical professionals in the area. Okay. 
Uh, so past court cases have shown that the American legal system, in principle, prioritizes the dignity of the deceased over the wishes of the living, even family members. The main Supreme Court, in a case involving a defendant who put a deceased infant to rest by throwing them in a river, concluded that any disposal of a dead body, which is contrary to common decency, is an offense. Kristen Smolensky, a legal scholar from Hofstra University, wrote on the rights of the dead and noted that the law strives to honor the deceased's wishes and to protect his interests because society has chosen, within limits, to adhere to the principle of autonomy. It is only in specific extreme circumstances where the disturbance of human remains is permitted by law. These situations only allow disinterment, the practice of digging up buried remains, to be used in cases such as criminal investigation. And even in this instance, the process is considered a temporary disturbance, and the remains are required to be put back to rest, so to speak. When the remains of a relative are disturbed unlawfully, uh, historical court cases in the past have permitted family members to receive compensation. These precedents, in fact, came out of the context of grave robbing in the 19th century, became uh, which became common as remains could be sold to medical researchers such as Morton in Philadelphia. Along with the principle of dignity, I was drawn to the idea of property in the context of human remains collections. This was largely because of the Morton collection's ties to slavery, as I discussed earlier. The ratification of the 13th Amendment in the U.S. Constitution in 1865 indicated, at least symbolically, that American society no longer tolerated the institution of slavery. This change codified the principle that people could not and should not be considered property in the United States. In the case of People v. Reed in 2013, a California court stated that the removal of human remains from their places of interment was not morally akin to property crimes, which solidified the idea today that human remains cannot be considered property. In 1893, the court case Pierce v. Proprietors of Swan Point Cemetery stated that the body is not property in the usually recognized sense of the word. Rather, the person with such a quasi-property interest has duties to perform towards it arising out of our common humanity. Indeed, a person who has charge of a dead body cannot be considered as the owner of it in any sense whatever. He holds it only as a sacred trust for the benefit of all who may, from family or friendship, have an interest in it. Even though legal cases from the 19th to the 20th, uh, 21st century have established the principle that human remains are not property, to some degree it seems that the Morton Collection, its treatment and its usage, has come dangerously close to treating remains as property, objects to be possessed and controlled, a legacy of the slavery and colonial power structures or coloniality it originated from. Okay. So Thomas Beauchamp and James Childress are two prominent American philosophers who outline four major principles used in the field of bioethics today. Two of these major principles are autonomy and beneficence, which we have already established are present in American legal history. As Pierce demonstrated, there is a legal precedent that those in care of human remains have a responsibility to act for the benefit of those who are connected to the body. We also discuss the principle of autonomy in relation to the dead. This leads me to my next topic on ethical principles in scientific research. Uh, so beneficence in, research, uh, beneficence in research can be understood as the need for research being conducted uh, to ultimately benefit the subject of that research. In cases where this has been violated, historical uh, events have established that reparative efforts must be made in order to atone for the transgression. This is seen in the case of the Tuskegee syphilis experiments. In that case, American public health researchers purposely withheld treatment from black research subjects in order to study the progression of syphilis. The principle of beneficence can also be applied to the Morton Collection and its potential in research today. And I will discuss this further later on, but first I want to go into the other major ethical principle, that is the notion of autonomy. Autonomy can be understood as the freedom to make choices without interference or limitation. The issue of autonomy in research is most commonly applied to living people and their ability to make decisions to participate in research. However, as I discussed earlier, the autonomy of the deceased is honored under the law and thus also needs to be considered in research ethics surrounding human remains. In regards to the Morton Collection, archival material indicates the wishes and perspectives of many of the Philadelphians who eventually were buried in the potter's field that was excavated by grave robbers. Um, a community petition was made in 1845 to authorities to prevent the increased grave robbing and body snatching in the potter's field. This petition was denied, however, citing how the pursuit of science and medical knowledge was more important than the dignity of this community's deceased. And so, we can see that the initial collection and research of many of the remains in the Morton Collection was done without the consent of the individual, other families, and moreover violated community standards of ethical treatment. 
In the 19th century, autonomy was not protected as it is now, and this allowed scientists such as Morton to conduct the mass collection and research of bodies. So, proponents of preserving human remains collections, like the Morton Collection, often cite future research opportunities as the primary reason to maintain collections. One of the most prominent examples of these research opportunities is in genetic analysis. While the remains in the Morton Collection are from individuals who lived in the not-so-distant past, the 19th century, genetic material from those remains are often considered ancient DNA, or ADNA. Scholars like David Reich at Harvard Medical School argue that ancient human remains offer a wealth of information that can lead to better understandings of population genetics and their development. This is heightened by continuing advancements in ADNA analytical technology that create new opportunities for genetic research. Anatomists and physical anthropologists have also highlighted the research value that skeletal remains from the 19th century like the Morton Collection might pose. Other proponents of maintaining collections have cited the idea of scientific heritage as well. In their view, collections of human remains offer a historically valuable legacy of a key moment in the development of science and medicine. But while the Morton Collection and others like it do offer potential for research, how would that comply with the established principles of autonomy and beneficence? Would that research truly be to the benefit, best interests, or in the spirit of the wishes of the individuals in the Morton Collection and those connected to them? Today, groups called descendant communities can fill in as advocates for the deceased black Philadelphians in the Morton Collection. In the case of human remains, descendant communities can be defined as modern groups who are descended in some way from the deceased individuals in question. The notion of descendant communities is commonly referred to today in discussions of repatriation, the process of returning remains to the communities they historically were connected to. In the United States, the repatriation process is primarily structured by the Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act of 1990, or NAGPRA. This legislation was created to regulate the return of items and remains stolen from Native American groups in the past, an issue that had historically been a problem in the United States due to the potential market value of items and artifacts found at Native American burial sites. However, no federal law currently regulates or protects the treatment or repatriation of black remains and collections specifically. Given this, the Penn Museum and their consideration of, Mort of the Morton Collection in the last couple of years used what they call a NAGPRA-informed infrastructure and process. Using NAGPRA as a model for the repatriation process of non-Native American remains is limited and insufficient in many regards. One of the issues with this standard is that it can be difficult to define descendant communities outside of lineal descendants and official tribal affiliations as NAGPRA dictates. In the case of the Morton Collection, this ambiguity can make it complicated to legally discern who gets decision-making power when it comes to modern black communities in Philadelphia. These communities often do not have clear methods of determining genetic descendants, nor is there the same sort of system of official categorical uh, affiliations like Native American tribes. NAGPRA is not the only model for considering the relationship between descendant communities and human remains. The clientage model is an alternative approach that focuses on treating the descendant communities as clients, that is to work for their best interest and follow their stated wishes. This model was demonstrated uh, in the African Burial Ground Project an archaeological site in New York City that is now a national monument. Dr. Michael Blakey, scientific director of the African Burial Ground Project, wrote in an article that the denial of culturally constructed group identity is simply to deny historical group vantages, rights, and responsibilities by reducing them to the presumably cultureless thoughts of individuals. That is to say, limiting uh, the de definition of descendant communities to the parameters in NAGPRA prevents identity groups like black communities in Philadelphia from achieving legitimacy, recognition, and autonomy. The inclusion of descendants' voices and their participation in the consideration of collections like the Morton Collection are critical to upholding the autonomy and justice that have been historically stripped from communities. Uh, the clientage model, exemplified through the African Burial Ground Project, demonstrated a promising new way for researchers to engage with communities in a more autonomous and bene beneficent, uh, beneficent sorry, fashion. However, the model has been greatly underutilized, which is demonstrated by the treatment of the Morton Collection and descendant communities today in some regards. So the connections of the Morton Collection to slavery and coloniality emphasize the importance of reparative uh, efforts by institutions. A lack of autonomy characterized the amassing of the Morton Collection. Today, some advocacy groups call for changes in stewardship and the decision-making process regarding the future of the Morton Collection in order to give autonomy back to the communities that have been impacted by colonial actors like Morton. 
Lira Montero and Abdul Ali Muhammad, are two activists who filed an objection to the Penn Museum's recent request to the Philadelphia Orphans Court to bury the remains of black Philadelphians in the Morton Collection. This objection was rooted in the issue of challenging the power dynamics that have long surrounded the Morton Collection and giving decision-making power back to descendant communities. The judge presiding over the objection, uh, objection recently denied the request of Montier and Muhammad and allowed Penn to start their proposed process, simply stating that they lack standing to participate as objectors. The specific wording of these two advocates lacking standing harkens back to the issue of defining and legitimizing descending communities. Who has the right to object and to advocate for communities today? The, the criteria for objection and participation was not outlined in the judge's decree. The denial of the objection and the maintenance of power given to Penn as an institution, ironically, seems to be a continuation of the colonial power structures that the history of the Morton Collection has been criticized for. While Penn has stated uh, they have taken the advice of community members in making their decision, the fact is a Philadelphia court, the same institution that enabled the initial collection of bodies by Morton, ultimately removed the power and autonomy from the hands of advocates representing the community most affected by the collection's future. And so I want to clarify that I do not intend to call out the Penn Museum, the court's judge, or other modern researchers I've discussed today as malicious in intent. I simply mean to draw attention towards the ways that the Morton Collection, its history and its future, seem to engage with critical ethical principles such as dignity, autonomy, and beneficence. In many regards, the Morton Collection exemplifies a dark legacy of this nation's past and acts as a reminder of the systemic issues that we have inherited. Understanding the ethical challenges surrounding the Morton Collection can act as a lesson for how we can reconcile with this heritage and move forward in addressing the problems facing our society today. Thank you. So uh, I would like to start off by acknowledging Wolf Humanity Center for believing in this project and allowing me to put it together. Uh, I want to thank my wonderful peers in the fellowship, everybody who's presenting today. You guys are incredible. And uh, my family, my, some of my family's here today. My dad might be watching on the live stream, but thank you all for, for believing in me and being here. So I feel fortunate to have been able to base my research around hip hop, a cultural force that has thoroughly shaped my life and has inspired me in countless ways personally. I'm just going to jump into the meat of my presentation by showing a small clip that I took at a rap show in Detroit. This is uh, going to be a friend of mine who graciously and formally agreed to be recorded for this purpose. And I love it. I think it, it goes a long way in painting the effective picture of the hip hop landscape in the city of Detroit. So uh, let's see if I can click to that. OK, let's see, let's see how this works. And what you rap about turn into a villain project live in be a madhouse really pray you lose your life the grace the darkness and despite the words they say we get away without a scratch i lit their match burned all my bridge cars no more I wrote these raps, I hope I brought to the world With all my blessings and earnings, my dividends and comeuppance Pray for all of them children who steady running them numbers Rappers looking for idols, niggas words be like Bibles Ain't been knighted, but I'ma love them in spite it, I really do Got a war sense of love, cause I fought for all my life just to end up in this dust But the way we live this life, feel like we stuck in this but the way we feel this, feel like it's nothing for us. I really pray, I really pray, I really pray. Hey, 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 hey. Nigga, I need the bed for Ethereum. It ain't nobody rapping like Lyrium. No. It ain't nobody special to be serious. In my ghetto, we yellow and furious. They turn red on my fellow with billions. But that better what level the theory is. I can settle for just the experience. I can settle for just the experience. Letter to you. When I say sunny, y'all say Bill. Then what you rap about, turn it to. Perfect. Okay, great. Um, so I show that video because hip hop is elusive. Uh, plenty of scholars in the past 30 years have sought to elucidate the cultural import of hip hop with varying degrees of success. Uh, Trisha Rose did so famously in her 1994 book, Black Noise, where she writes that hip hop, quote, is a cultural form that, a form that attempts to negotiate the experiences of marginalization, brutally truncated opportunity, and oppression within the cultural imperatives of African American and Caribbean histor history, identity, and community. It is the tension between the cultural fractures produced by post-industrial oppression and the binding ties of black cultural expressivity that set the, the critical frame for the development of hip hop. So in a short few sentences, Rose lays out the stakes of hip hop music and culture. 
a response to the feelings of social alienation, an expression of postmodern black imaginings, and a voice for disenfranchised people to reclaim personhood, dignity, and establish communal ties. And at the same time that hip hop has emerged as a preeminent cultural force in post-industrial black America, there is a concurrent trend on the rise in the socio-cultural landscape of the black inner city. In 1993, Cornell West identifies, quote, the problem of nihilism, which he understands as a kind of absence of meaning, loss of hope, an existential despair constellated with feelings of self-worthlessness, skepticism about objective values, and a feeling that nothing in the universe truly matters. My objective was to investigate the relationship between nihilism among the young black men of the inner city and their creative impulse towards the creation of hip hop music. This qualitative research finds me in conversation with four young black Detroit rappers aged 20 to 23 who each have something unique to say about why they create music and what it accomplishes for them in fashioning new possibilities for the self and the world around them. Now through this research, I have found that black male nihilism of the inner city that Wes talks about and hip hop music interact in a special kind of relationship. I argue that for some black men, hip hop performance has fulfilled a yearning for the phenomenological value of life in spite of a lingering sense that there is no innate God ordained purpose of living. This, I believe, is indicative of a kind of constructive nihilis constructivist nihilism that has formed and taken root in the black American underclass, a sense that precisely because life is essentially meaningless, they are empowered to create new meaning and value structure. Now, from the beginning of its relevance in, popular, in American popular culture, hip hop has received criticism for its profane attitude towards traditional value and for uh, purportedly encouraging destructive behavior. On the contrary, I propose that hip hop culture in the inner city often takes on an exact opposite role, a tool for the positive reinforcement of life's meaning, imbuing participants with a sense that they have the power to reconstruct their worlds of disillusionment around life-affirming values of their conscious experience. In this sense, hip hop is an art form which participates in the willful building and reification of alternative but real worlds, not the destruction of the objective one. It is at this point that nihilism becomes transformed, not so much the obstacle which inhibits or restricts one's agency or will, but the open space upon which old architectures of value are contested and new ones reimagined. Charged with the impulses of constructivist nihilism, young black men turn to creative outlets with the expectation that through regimented self-expression, they may create a new order of conscious life that refuses despair, refuses resignation, but instead encourages refashioning the world into whatever gives them the grandest sense of spiritual existential purpose in the local community and beyond. So, what is, what is meant when, we're, when talking about the broad philosophy of nihilism? Well, nihilism is the belief uh, in the ultimate meaninglessness of human existence, uh, marked by a rejection of ethical values. I'm speaking very broadly. Um, a true nihilist believes that there is no meaning to the universe, no purpose of human living, and therefore no reason to respect any particular code of morals or values. The nihilistic philosophy was fleshed out by 19th century German philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche. Um, and Nietzsche distinguishes between two dispositions of nihilism, which he calls active and passive. Uh, this, this is, this is, these are his ideas, not mine. Passive nihilism, he says, is characterized by a resignation when faced with the bleak prospects of meaninglessness, an acceptance to the idea that nothing matters and the despair that comes with it. Active nihilism is characterized by the creation of new values in place of traditional ones that one has become disaffected with. Active nihil the active nihilist takes universal meaninglessness as a chance to forge their own meaning. I personally am not a fan of how Nisha makes these dispositions seem like essential parts of a person's character. So for this project, I make a different distinction between what I call constructivist and destructivist nihilism in order to place and strip away the emphasis from essentialism and place it rather on how, these, how and why these outlooks take shape. To the pure constructivist nihilist, meaning can be made, and to the pure destructivist nihilist, uh, meaning can only be destroyed. But I acknowledge that these are only heuristic descriptors of nihilistic outlooks, and I don't believe that there is actually a categorical um, 
distinction or discreteness to them. Uh, I, I often think that these two things exist in, in, in continual interplay with one another. But this distinction is important in the context of West's realization that many of the social issues facing post-industrial black America both in part arise with and cyclically reinforce nihilism, this absence of meaning, loss of hope, uh, which leads to an existential despair and worthlessness that hangs over communities and adds a spiritual burden to being black in America, in turn producing a constellation of antisocial behavior and indifference to moral principles that orient society. So I myself seek to elaborate on West's claim, uh, uh, claims about nihilism by introducing a philosophical strain of thought that he, he nor his respondents tend to engage much with, and uh, that's phenomenology. Phenomenology is a philosophical movement which investigates structures of consciousness and experience, especially in relation to being. Uh, phenomenologists will often say that the ultimate meaning and value of something derives from experience of that thing and thus things attain their value through conscious experience. My research indicates that underground hip hoppers in Detroit take on an ethos of hard phenomenology. Young black men believe that through the conscious experience of creative forms such as hip hop, they are able to forge a new being in the world. Whereas the nihilist contends that there is no objective value, these creative artists believe that the value of life and one's being can be performed into existence. I argue that through expressive life ways such as hip hop, the nihilistic self becomes an object of intentionality that is simultaneously contested and affirmed, and the feeling of nihilism itself is made legible. Okay, so time to talk about the actually interesting part of this project, which is the study itself. Um, the study collects ethnographic data from a series of semi-structured interviews with my four participants, black men aged 20 to 23, who actively create and perform hip hop music in the city of Detroit. Um, I, uh, I choose Detroit because I'm from Detroit. It's a city that I love. And if you know anything about Detroit, you know that Detroit is a city gutted by a tragic history of deindustrialization, disinvestment, political failure, white flights, uh, uh, um, class tension, racial and class tension. So this means that the prospects for young people in modern day Detroit often look bleak, which in turn, I argue, gives rise to the popular subcultural forms such as hip hop, which actively defy sentiments of total meaninglessness. So each participant engaged with me in, in three separate interviews, 20 to 30 minutes in length, um, each interview with a different theme. Uh, in the first, I asked questions centered on background spirituality and conscious philosophies. In the second, I asked questions focusing on the function of musical expression in everyday life. And in the third, I asked questions centering on personal disposition towards experiencing and creating music. Some key themes that I kept in mind included significance of religion, value structures, ideological aberrance, and musical expression in day-to-day -day life. I sought to construct an, an assessment on how each participant's relationship to music making was mediated by feelings of nihilism. So I'm going to be referring, obviously, to my participants not by their real names, but by pseudonyms. And I've chosen Dimitri, Cairo, Martin, and Davion. So the first pattern I noticed was how they described their respective relationships to religious value with a striking congruence. Generally, they grew up in traditional Christian households and became disenchanted with religion at some point during their adolescent years. In the case of Davion and Cairo, this disenchantment grew from certain conflicts that they had with religious systems that they grew up with, as well as more theological doubts about the existence of God. Um, in response to the question, what is your relationship to, to religion and how has that evolved over time, uh, Davion said, quote, my upbringing, I was born in a Christian household, but we left Christianity and moved closer to the nation of Islam and the Moors. After that, I completely left religion. I just didn't care about it no more. If I was to believe that God, if I was to believe in God, I believe that there is no connection with God. God really don't care about me. Is there a God? I don't know. It could be or it couldn't be. But if it is, why would he care about me? So this encapsulates much of the spiritual leanings of my participants. There is some atheistic ag agnostic feeling, and that's layered with a sense of the self being so far removed from God so as to be outside the scope of God, so as to feel almost worthless in the eyes of God. And so this shapes his more cynical disposition towards organized religion. Um, let's see. 
All my participants describe having experienced feelings of meaninglessness. Martin and Cairo interpret these feelings rather positively. Martin argues that these feelings empower him to make things matter by simply doing what it is, actualizing on what he desires uh, or otherwise feels called toward. Um, similarly, uh, Cairo embraces feelings of meaninglessness because they remind him of his humanness and empathy towards the world around him. In both these cases, my interlocutors relate taking in sensations that may be considered life-threatening and redirecting them until they become pointed tools with which they interrogate and mediate the external self that exists within various groups, domains, and interconnected systems. They find a way to redress meaninglessness as a necessary path to travel on the way towards self-redemption in a world that has granted them few breaks and chances. Now, on the other hand, uh, Davion and Dimitri believe that meaninglessness was a phase of their lives that precipitated negative self-perception and depressive moods, but they, they say that their lives now are much better because they have acted upon this drive towards constructive, creative life ways. So in this sense, rapping is believed to be kind of dynamic and ritualistic. It's a necessity in order to avoid this existential despair. Similarly, all my uh, interlocutors readily, readily acknowledge that they have constantly felt like their lives were not valuable, and they all admit to adopting this belief at a very young age. In response to the question, have you ever felt like your life was not valuable, Martin states, oh yeah, a lot of times. I think death just made me self-aware as a kid. It made me hyper-aware, like just seeing death, especially my dad dying. I think the most important lesson I learned from that is that nothing really matters. But it was kind of a freeing feeling when I first felt it as a kid, because if shit don't matter for real, then that means I can make my world the way I want to make it. I think that's been one of my biggest mantras. Right here, we see the philosophical groundwork of constructivist nihilism, this self-bestowed ability to augment value structures and reshape one's world through one's own conscious effort. Um, now, Dimitri, Martin, and Cairo all take a similar angle. To them, true, true living entails forging of one's passion and an active quest to find one's purpose in society where he resides. So again, this making of the self to be a phenomenal object, a thing which could and should be built into existence. Um, all my participants believe that existence precedes essence, meaning that existence comes before the value or purpose of a thing. One is not born with value, but rather procures value through existence. So this came up uh, when I was talking to my participants about why they make hip hop music. Dimitri states, quote, hip hop allows us to transfer energy, the intangibles, into something that is a way of understanding those that we don't understand. Martin states, quote, music is really just freedom. Nowadays, it's something that goes along with the idea that nothing matters. When I'm making music, nothing matters except music. It's just something that I make matter. It's something driving you, knowing how you want a song to sound in the end. Cairo states, quote, rap is the most natural way to express any type of thought, any type of emotion, any type of idea. I feel like if I can make it rhyme, I can make it translate, at least to me. To most, if not all, my participants, the prospect of self-expression necessarily entails an aspect of self-construction. That is, they believe that authenticity in their music creation necessitates casting off labels, typologies, and parameters in style and presentation. Inheriting a long, a long tradition of hip hop moral code, they suggest that self-authenticity is the key value, value that drives their music thematically and sonically. Power and freedom were words that came up a lot in describing their music making. Participants associate music with the free reign to engage in regimented self-construction. Music gives them the ability to make their lives matter and by extension make their worlds matter. Notably, uh, my interlocutors all contradict the conventional notion that nihilistic, the nihilistic individual largely disregards the future or lacks foresight to envision, envision ramifications of present actions. Indeed, all four of my participants um, provided insight into future plans and their hopes uh, to fulfill those plans, which often exhibited a desire to foster personal and communal growth at the same time. Music is just a tool, Martin says, as he tells me that his future plans are undecided and will largely depend on following extemporaneous impulses to create and construct. 
Cairo and Dimitri both say that they are, quote, here to create, expressing a sense of predestination to their passion ventures. They pivot once again on the desire to grow as people and gain new knowledge that can be passed around to others. In all these answers, it is clear that while music is not the only valuable structure of expression in their lives, all my interlocutors believe that it is quite essential to who they are and what they are seeking to accomplish in life. Most participants believe that this creative impulse is, is essential to their identity and orchestrates their desire to engage in the world positively. Okay, so now what can be said about everything I just showed you? The interlocutors of this study all demonstrated one common precept, that life has no objective meaning, no preordained truth or essence in itself. But this belief did not end in feelings of existential despair or self-doubt. On the contrary, it became the foundation for a new value system that puts life affirmation at the forefront of one's creative endeavors, making hip hop a kind of vehicle for the belief in a radical self-fashioning in pursuit of a higher ontology, the basis of a well-rounded imagination that can envision a future for oneself and one's community that far exceeds present circumstances. In this sense, hip hop is an operative tool through which individuals who have become disillusioned with prospects of life's higher purpose can start, believe that they can start building up one for themselves, performing themselves into renewed existence from a state of despair or confusion. And so as an anthropologist, I'm thinking about what, this, what I think this says in the grand scheme of the human picture. And so here's what I suggest. I think my research speaks to the profundity of the human spiritual yearning towards meaning and our constant engagement in processes and activities of meaning making. Uh, my interlocutors are very intelligent, very, very self-possessed individuals, and their responses, they showed an excellent ability to reflect on a personal level about their worldviews, while also taking into humble consideration the social conditions of their surroundings and how they are capable of influencing people in different ways. They conveyed to me that while it is true that Detroit has been a locus of economic and political strain, it is also a city with a vibrant creative scene. And so I want this to show that there is no facile single narrative to inner city blackness. While we mustn't doubt the fact that objective structures shape uh, people's lived reality in a real way, we must resist narratives that cast black people as mere avatars of victimization, passive passengers of oppression, subhumans perpetually subjugated to objective structures that they have no control over or negotiation with, and forced to live in a state of nihilistic despair and resentment towards the world. My research reveals the ways in which I in which people constantly seek to carve out dignity and identity on their own terms, negotiating with the world around them. Now, this project is not just some advertisement for hip hop. Um, I'm not under the impression that hip hop is some radically life-saving godhead or anything like that. Rather, I hope to show the power of constructive life ways such as hip hop when they are united to life-affirming ideology. The greater argument here being that if we are going to meaningfully address the problem of nihilism, we must consider making space for architectures of disillusion while engaging in radical, enga radical encouragement towards value construction, while holding up institutions which affirm the importance of constructing and promoting positive values, namely the inherent non-contingent worth of human life everywhere and our shared duty to one another. Thank you. Good afternoon, and thank you to Dr. Thomas for your generous time, as well as the rest of the Wolf Humanity Center staff for making this year's forum on heritage possible. Um, I want to begin this presentation of my research project by placing this work in context with active discussions about decoloniality, repatriation, and cultural heritage. <clears throat> this research considers the vast discourse of musical repatriation through the scope of a single object, an ukulele from one of the instrument's pioneers held by the Penn Museum. By using frameworks of decoloniality, the repatriation of goods goes beyond what is mandated, and ethical demands of objects like musical instruments become part of the conversation that we invite source communities to have. My project takes into account the importance of decolonial work for stakeholders and gatekeepers of cultural heritage. Repatriation of materials 
should not be a contentious discourse, but one that considers needs of different materials and needs of communities in conjunction. The discourse of musical repatriation largely ignores physical instruments. I suggest that musical instruments create a different type of sound archive, which requires more work to reconnect the social life of these things. My work in the past year has attempted to connect an object with murky provenance to larger processes of power imbalance in collecting, as well as the mistreatment of materials in museum contexts. From a single credit line, I was able to place this ukulele in the lineage of Hawaiians past and present. This project suggests that the status of this instrument and countless others in the museum's collections urges more attention than presently given. By treating musical instruments as materials that demand to be to breathe and be played, the life of these objects can be prolonged as benchmarks of cultural past, present, and future. As it sits now, the ukulele is essentially dead, but what can be done to make its voice heard again? For some context, I will present a brief history of the ukulele as it existed until the moment one arrived in the Penn Museum's archives by 1905. I'm sure you're all familiar in one way or another with the four-stringed instrument that resembles a pint-sized guitar. While it is not an instrument entirely indigenous to Hawaii, the ukulele has become an international symbol of the sights, sounds, and peoples of the islands. It is a symbol of the ongoing struggle to explain Hawaiianness for the Polynesian, Asian, Iberian, and other communities who hold stakes in this culture. The ukulele inherits most of its features from Portuguese instruments, but its development in Hawaii popularized it for stages and homes around the world. Around the 1870s, many itinerant workers migrated to Hawaii to fill t positions in taro patches and other plantations. Among these were three men, Manuel Nunes, Jose de Espirito Santo, and Augusto Diaz, um, who arrived to the islands by way of steamship from Madeira, an island in Portugal's Azores. After their contracts as field hands were up, the three men remained in Honolulu working as cabinet makers and contractors. By the 1880s, they translated their woodworking skills to simple luthery, repairing mandolins, violins, and guitars, <clears throat> while also fashioning their own versions of the five-string Madeiran machete and larger-bodied rajo. While the earliest instruments were mostly sold to other Portuguese workers and became known as taro patch fiddles, modifications like changing materials and reducing the amount of strings needed uh, uniquely adapted this instrument for Hawaiian life. Indigenous performers picked up the instrument quickly and they named it ukulele, or bouncing flea, as the energetic sound spread across the islands like wildfire. Almost as rapidly, the instrument reached steamships filled with tourists who wanted to bring home their own slice of this exotic Hawaiian sound. The early examples of ukuleles built by Santos, Diaz, and Nunes laid the foundations for an explosion of Hawaiian cultural symbols in the United States. Although Nunes only started his formal ukulele com company in 1910, depictions of Hawaii for the rest of the world relied on exports of performed culture. The exoticization of island life and commodification of Hawaiian culture was the result of a rapidly growing tourism industry that painted a scene of the cheerful tropics with the blooming hibiscus and bright sounds of the bouncing flea. The rapid dissemination and appropriation of cultural products created challenges for indigenous Hawaiians to claim sovereignty over their land, heritage, and life. Ukuleles in this early period took on symbols of Hawaiianness, being decorated with motifs of local landscapes and spiritual symbols and like on the right side, the crest of the King of Hawaii. Even the wood being used to build these instruments tied into a message of sovereignty in the overthrown kingdom, where indigenous koa wood signified that ukuleles had, and would be, had been and would continue to be Hawaiian. From here, I would like to move to a closer glance at the Nunez ukulele held in the Penn Museum's possession. This is a photograph of Hotel Street in Honolulu dating to 1890, uh, right around when Manuel Nunez's shop was on the street. When I first saw the instrument, I was struck by its age and unique details, which place it in such an interesting historical context. The credit line simply notes received from various sources pre-1929 and lists some visual observations before saying it dates to between 1884 and 1889. This is simply not enough context to understand the rich cultural life that this ukulele once embodied and the significance it holds in today's world. The lack of provenance dating over this past century creates a real challenge to finding out more about this instrument and attempting to conduct research on it. The problem lies in a lack of important details being taken from the instrument entering its the archive through its life within the collection. 
As a result, this instrument and many others in the collection are essentially dead because of how far removed from source communities and how often they've been in oversight and research. After looking in the museum archives, I was able to find only two references to this instrument since it was accessioned. The first is this letter written from Clarence P. Franklin in 1904 to the curator offering two instruments, one ukulele and one shamisen. There is no record of the shamisen in the Penn Museum's collection, and the second note regarding Franklin is a list of a handful of piecemeal instruments donated around this time. A closer look at Franklin reveals that he was a medical student, and at some point before failing his medical exams twice, uh, he took a steamship voyage to Australia in the late 1800s, stopping in Hawaii and Japan on the voyage. After looking at the ukulele in the Penn Museum's collection studies room, the rift between conservation and restoration becomes more tangled. With my previous experience working in shops repairing and building guitars, this analysis instructs an idea of how to get the instrument's voice back. There is significant damage to the instrument, like several splits along the back and sides, uh, back and front pieces, as well as warping of the shoulders of the instrument throughout the sides. This indicates a real lack of humidity control for this delicate object, whether as a result of Franklin's steamship travels or 120 years of neglect in the Penn Museum's collection storage. A patina of dirt combined um, with the extremely dry surface shows that the instrument was not protected by anything, whereas ones that are frequently played and maintained are often sealed by oils from hands or special conditioners. Although conservation records only date back as far as the 1970s, there is not a single entry for this instrument. There is evidence of this ukulele being played before it entered the collections, with divots on the frets and strum marks just at the bottom of the rosette, um, or the sound hole. Whether or not Dr. Franklin bought this instrument as a simple souvenir is not clear, but there is a sense that this ukulele was played frequently up until it was donated. Inside the ukulele is a handwritten label from Nunez's shop, locating it at 46 Hotel Street. On the back of the instrument, someone else inscribed Honolulu, August 1889. The ukulele invites one to think about the cultural symbolism of the instrument, a record which does not exist because no research has been done on it. This instrument is built from native koa wood, prized as a symbol of Hawaiian indigeneity. Builders switched to this as materials became markers for the support of an empire soon to be overthrown by, imper by imperial interests. Additionally, the engravings on this instrument show unique signs of Hawaiian life as well as Franklin's. There are a few inscriptions that aren't pictured here which say CFP and one which says U of P um, for the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, there's another which depicts Leahi on the right, um, a volcanic ridge uh, which overlooks the popular beach of Waikiki. This landmark is considered a sacred site of reverence and worship in Hawaiian spirituality, who built sacrificial altars and held religious ceremonies there. In 1895, a notable battle broke out between royalist rebels and the colonist governments on its slope. In Hawaiian spirituality, the sacred energy of mana is embodied by ritual sites like Diamond Head Ridge and by objects that hold the life of the user. This life energy flows through all things and people, indicating how important recognizing mana is for understanding Hawaiian culture, and how important it is for objects like this to stay alive. After speaking with some members of the Ukulele Hall of Fame Museum, as well as historians on the ukulele, there is a consensus that this instrument is one of the oldest known examples surviving. There is only one Nunez ukulele that experts know of to be older than the Penn Museums, uh, which is pictured on the right. Because of the rarity of this piece, other examples can be used to compare techniques, conditions, and overall functions. The craftsmanship of the Penn Museum ukulele is fairly similar to examples by Diaz and Santos, but comparing differences across Nunez's own work is the most interesting. The instruments from 1885 and 1888 show various levels of detail with more elaborate rosettes, more elaborate binding, and different inlays, which tells me that it, we could have an object earlier um, or perhaps at a cheaper trim level than uh, these ones. Let me see. Um, this example dates to 1895, and although it comes from a little later, it's a great display of preservation and restoration at work with the interests of music at its core. Ukulele Friend is a boutique retailer which sells vintage, antique, and custom high-end instruments in Honolulu. This is a stunning benchmark for the craft of making these earliest ukuleles and showcases the fine work of Manuel Nunez from the arched back to the type of wood used and the inlays across the fingerboard. 
This museum-grade ukulele offers insight to how long instruments can survive, particularly when communities of knowledge are given agency over its circulation. Although Ukulele Friend offers sale of upwards of $20,000 instruments, this one is not for sale um, and is held in value basically only because of its historical significance. Um, I want to play you a video of one of these instruments being played. Um, this is an 1890 instrument by another one of the ukulele's pioneers, um, but it gives you a great idea to how these sound and how they're treated today. Hey, what's up guys? Well, I have this beautiful ukulele from the 1800s, I believe. Um, super small, super loud, super pretty. And so we're gonna do a song called Kowa Loku. I'm gonna have some fun with this one and uh, hope my fingers fit. <laughs> Ultimately, the construction of these early ukuleles shows that the pioneers laid the groundwork for their craft to spread across the world and be seen in so many players today, in players' hands today. Although Nunez, Santos, and Diaz were not trained luthiers, their work influenced established mu musical communities from performers to builders alike. From looking at the construction of the Nunez ukulele, it's clear that these workers had made strides with what they had and adapted to the Hawaiian landscape. The unique elements of the ukulele by the three Madeirans rocketed this instrument as a mainstay of long-established builders. Pictured on the left is an example from 1913 by Pennsylvania-based C.F. Martin Company, who began to sell their own models of the ukulele. In 1917, Martin sold nearly 2,000 ukuleles, as many guitars and mandolins as it had sold for the past decade combined. The growth of these storied musical industries could not have happened without the work of these, its pioneers, and these... Early ukuleles are certainly not primitive instruments like outside views of the time would suggest. Um, on the right is one made by Leonardo Nunez, uh, who is Manuel's son, um, and really like shows how incredible the craftwork has gotten with the figured koa top. Um, looking at musical instruments in other museums gives a reference for how these objects are valued, displayed, and treated in other contexts. While the Musical Instrument Museum in Arizona has a strong sense of communicating the lives of these objects, other ethnographic museums show what could be done with ours. Honolulu's Bishop Museum held an exhibition in 2020 featuring instruments that spanned Hawaii's musical legacy, from these earliest ukuleles to ones played by international star Israel Kamaka Viva Ole. Measuring distance from the past to the ongoing impact of Hawaiian sound, could only be done by working with local experts who valued the life of these musical instruments. Interpretations of this legacy today show that culture is still produced by descendant communities who play, maintain, and restore these artifacts of musical life. From here, I want to bring the issues towards a larger institutional discussion by thinking of some of the archival work I've done in the Penn Museum. From the museum's foundation, issues of overcollection and underfunding have challenged objects which demand particular care. As a result, this project seeks to sound an alarm about how specifically crucial these problems are for musical instruments in museum collections. The first and only exhibit focusing on musical instruments in the Penn Museum happened from 1950 to 1958. This exhibit largely featured the donations of Sarah Frischmuth, a wealthy collector in the late 19th and early 20th century who amassed thousands of antique instruments. The portrait on the right side um, features the widow of America's first aluminum mogul, 
painted by Thomas Aikens in 1900. In just the year before, archival correspondence tells us that she donated nearly a thousand instruments to the museum. This exhibition was curated on a tone of musical evolution, showing that a 4,000-year-old Babylonian lyre or an antique rattle from Nepal were in some way distinctly primitive ancestors to instruments from the European Renaissance. While musical instruments had this moment in the museum, not enough was done to preserve the rest of the collection or keep a proper record of the display. The only curator to work specifically within the musical instrument collection was Agi Yambor, an, um, a Hungarian pianist who held the position for four years. Throughout her tenure, she writes frequently about the significance of this collection and pens dozens of grant appeals to remedy the drastic needs of these instruments. As a result of neglect, literally countless instruments were destroyed or lost because of improper storage, like stacking pianos on top of one another and the lack of a comprehensive catalog. She wrote in one letter that the collection in the Penn Museum was second only to the Smithsonian institutions, putting it at one of the highest significance ones in the world. The frustration of working in this archive no doubt carries on through today, where a worsened state of care questions any scientific reason to hold on to these instruments. Since Yambor's tenure, we still have very little access to the musical instruments of the Penn Museum. This creates significant barriers like research, for researchers like myself interested in these objects, but more importantly, restricts source communities from even knowing that their cultural heritage exists in a sub-basement on the other side of the world. After the many acquisitions made over nearly 150 years by the Penn Museum, there are still 4,000 instruments accounted for in the collection's records. 300 are noted to have been deaccessioned, meaning they were destroyed, given away, or discarded, of which 200 were from Frischmuth's collection. Two instruments have already been returned to Tlingit communities of the Northwest Coast, which sets precedent for musical repatriation as a goal for some instruments. The division of this collection by culture class means that keepers are each challenged by the specific needs of musical instruments and often have to overlook important items like this ukulele in telling the story of human heritage. In conclusion, I offer this project back to the institutional gatekeepers of heritage. The mass collection of musical instruments with no support for their continued life ties into an ongoing process of over-representing material cultures but under-representing their people. Decirculating instruments like this ukulele creates a situation in which the voice of the community is essentially muzzled as their music becomes displaced. My research points to this instrument as a missing link in the significant cultural history of Hawaiian music and asks the museum what it really values out of a collection like this. In an ongoing discourse of musical repatriation, it is important that the unique qualities of musical instruments are considered as communities that were once being studied can now tell their own stories and sing their own songs. Thank you. Thank you for a set of really interesting papers. I know some of you have sort of participated in the development of these projects. Um, and it's really nice to see them um, you know, come to the, the kind of fullness that um, we heard today. So when I was uh, reading them in advance and then um, hearing them again being presented now, uh, they, they raised a number of questions uh, for me that I want to pose and talk about a little bit. But um, before I do that, I want to take us back to actually the title of this entire symposium, right, which is The World We Inherit. And I want us to think a little bit about the inheritances that uh, we inhabit in this world. And if you've ever taken a class with me, and two of the three of you have, um, you, you will understand that what I mean right now is um, to think about the inheritance of Western modernity, right? And to understand that the world that we inherit is a world that is really saturated by foundational violences of conquest, of colonialism, of the transatlantic slave trade, of imperialism, of genocide, um, and of the philosophical um, and ideological beliefs that then have become canonized in order to support those processes, right? And to represent us to ourselves as part of 
uh, a, a part of that world that we inhabit, right? And so we get this, I think, most clearly from Ezra's paper when he's talking about Philadelphia really being a center of the development of scientific racism um, for a number of reasons. Of course, Philly is the first of many. You know, my kids were born in the first hospital in the United States. We're in the first secular university in the United States. Um, so we also then uh, have the, the privilege and, of course, bear the burden of being the firsts to really elaborate a science of race, the legacies of which we still contend with in various kinds of ways today in the museum and beyond, and I'll come back to that in a minute. Um, so if this is the world that we inherit, then uh, the questions that these papers really, really raised for me um, have to do with <clears throat> what rights do we have to our bodies, to our cultural practices, to our cultural materials, to something called heritage? Um, what does it mean to have sovereignty, to be self-determined, to be autonomous? Uh, in what ways and through what channels do we imagine and attempt to bring into being new worlds, life of the kind that you're talking about, Wes? Um, and ultimately, uh, what is justice? Um, and a, a, a side question that to me, because uh, I inhabit the museum, because the Department of Anthropology is in the, the Penn Museum, uh, a side question to the what is justice question is really what should museums be today? Uh, what is and should be the role of museums in contemporary society? So I just want to um, raise, I'm actually going to get my water. <laughs> <laughs> um, I want to um, sort of raise a couple conceptual things in relation to those questions that I just asked um, that I think you all talked about in different ways um, very profoundly. One has to do with property and ownership. And here I think the question of law that you're discussing, Ezra, is so important um, in, in different kinds of ways, right? The way that you're talking about law um, is, is in a way kind of vindicationist, right? You're, you're showing that in fact human remains are the ancestors who live with me in the museum, who saturate my experience of the museum, are in fact uh, not codified as property, right, under law, and therefore must be understood as something other than property, um, something living, something, uh, something that belongs to a people and, and a group. And in fact, this is being arrogated by the ways that museums are holding and containing um, ancestors, right? But I also think about property as a, as a, as a uh, you know, as a, as a tenet of law, right? And as a tenet of Western modern law, and as a tenet in particular of John Locke, right? And thinking about um, how, how one can advance a claim toward land, uh, which was Locke's innovation, right? That we can go somewhere else and take people's land because we are transforming it. Right? We are making an intervention into how the land is used, whereas these idle people were just sort of leaving it alone and not turning it into something um, productive, right? Um, and, and also then um, in relation to uh, people, right? And the ways that certain people, um, in particular enslaved persons in the United States, can be uh, legally defined as property and as less than human or three-fifths of human. So I wanted to ask you about how you, you don't have to answer right now, I'm going to lay out all the questions first, right? I wanted to ask about how you reconcile those two uses of law, because we all do that, right? We use law to advance particular progressive causes and claims, while also always recognizing that law is built on that same foundation right, of um, settler colonialism, and in, in some ways can never fully transcend that moment of, of origin. Right? Um, uh, and I'm going to skip you for a second, Wes, and just stay in the museum for a minute and, um, and, and think, uh, think with you a bit, P 
here about your really beautiful paper. Do you play, by the way? I play guitar mostly, but a bunch of other stuff too, yeah. Okay. Um, Yeah, I really enjoyed uh, your discussion of both the provenance of the, quote, object in the museum, but also the way, the trajectories through which these objects move globally and then end up um, end up in um, in museums, and uh, I was interested in in your uh, discussion in the question of translation, um, and th- and thinking it, it reminded me of uh, being at a conference at the Pitt Rivers Museum in Oxford, which is sort of the uber ethnographic museum, um, and the uber sort of display of Imperial Collections Museum. And if any of you have uh, been there, uh, you will recognize what I'm about to discuss, which is that in that museum, unlike in ours, um, they display based on categories of things, right? So any weapon from anywhere in the world will be over in that section, or any mask from any spiritual tradition, tradition will be over in that section. So it's sort of a, a clearinghouse of the British Empire, in a way, of the cultural practices of people throughout you know, the empire upon which the sun never set. Um, and um, at that conference, one of the curators, uh, they've, they've been doing a lot of really innovative and interesting uh, decolonial work in that museum. And one of the curators was talking about one of the projects that they were doing, which was to bring Tlingit uh, community members to um, engage their own materials that are in the museum. Um, in part because there were no longer people in that community who could make some of the objects that were there, so they wanted to present them with those objects so that they could reintroduce those practices into the community. And also in part to sort of invigorate um, uh, stuff thought about as object when, in fact, many Tlingit imagined those things as persons, right, and as ancestors. So she was discussing a moment when one of the community members picked up, um, uh, I'm not sure what we would call it, sort of almost a giant puppet, right, made out of wood with which that community did a dance, right, and the person started dancing with the object, right? And all of the conservators who were witnessing this totally freaked out because they were so afraid that it was going to break or that it was going to, you know, pieces were going to come off um, and that it it wasn't going to be pristine anymore, right? And the the people from the community were telling them, no, this is how this is used. It's supposed to be used this way. Eventually it will break. These these ancestors are not meant to be held into perpetuity, right? They're meant to be part of an active, living, breathing set of community practices and rituals, right? Um, So I wanted to hear you riff a little bit more, I think, on that problem of translation, um, how an object becomes an object in a museum instead of... Um, sort of part of a living and breathing fabric within a community, and you 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 touched on it to sort of um, uh, when you're talking about um, how how these uh, instruments are deteriorating in in museums, and so I'd like to hear your thoughts on what could be done within museums to um, to change that and to um, uh, approximate a more living kind of experience, right? Um, As they also might be repatriated. Mm -hmm. Um, And then Wes, really lovely ethnographic um, work on um, certainly one of the ways in which we imagine new worlds, right? Popular cultural production as a way to both refuse um, the uh, the spaces that we're given uh, in terms of expressing humanity and to create something else out of experience. And so I wanted to ask you something about Nietzsche. Oh, man. 
um, not because I need you to elaborate on European uh, philosophy, but because uh, I wanted, you know, I understand that you're writing a thesis and you're really interested in nihilism, which is, you know, the big term for someone like Nietzsche. Um, but I'm so interested in uh, in your use of him, uh, given your interest in and commitment to experience, right? Because Nietzsche clearly would not have had the experience um, to, um, you know, if you're thinking phenomenologically, right, um, to imagine a different kind of framework for thinking about life. And so I wanted to ask you if you thought there might be um, other frameworks right to to think with and through in order to um, advance uh, a, a, advance a sort of transformed understanding of how one makes life right how uh, how one makes a way out of no way right which is of course a phrase used in many different ways in different parts of the African diaspora. And I'm thinking in particular here of um, transnational black feminists and the work of people like uh, Denise Ferreira da Silva, um, Tina Camp, Saidia Hartman, this uh, collective I'm part of called the Practicing Refusal Collective, um, to sort of, again, undo those sort of foundational Western um, modes of uh, political philosophy in particular that cannot ever account for our ways of making life and of, of being. Um, and so I wanted to um, hear you think about that a little bit. And also I wanted to just pick up something one of your interlocutors said in terms of being worthless to God. Um, and, I, uh, and, you know, they talked also about being raised in a Christian church and then moving away from that or outside of it in different kinds of ways. But if one is worthless to God, one is worthless to that God, to the Christian God, right? To the Christian God of their upbringing, but not necessarily to the divine more generally or to a, a different way of imagining one's relationship to however they want to say it, a higher power or a liberty or, you know, some other kind of formulation like that. Um, and of course, in many places um, around and throughout the African diaspora, of course, um, other religious frameworks have been created to account for a kind of disillusionment with Christianity. At the same time, Christianity, of course, has been mobilized toward politically progressive ends as well. So I just wanted to hear you sort of talk about um, that a little bit, and then perhaps we can end um, with some kind of, I know you all probably have questions as well, but some kind of collective discussion about um, what, what we do with the world we inherit, right? And um, what, what institutions should do, what museums should do, what... Uh, forms of life making should we support? Uh, and I'll pause there. Great. Um, well, thank you. I, I guess I can start um, by responding to your comments. Um, thank you for coming. Thank you for moderating this discussion um, and your very insightful comments and questions onto our papers. I know it, um, it's probably a little difficult to synthesize everything um, that we discussed today, but I feel like you did a very good job of that. Um, and to respond to your initial question to me on how we can reconcile um, kind of the, the institution of the law, especially um, in America today with, like, I guess the modern, more pro like progressive uses of the law. Um, I think your comment on like the, the three uh, fifths of the person, um, that kind of reminded me of something that I um, came upon in my own research and that um, that kind of goes back to how in the 19th century, um, the law was very explicitly used to define um, racial groups. Um, specifically like the distinctions between um, who is white, who is black, um, who is the other. Um, and I think in if we look back in American legal history, we can see that um, even though American law has like uh, a foundation of colonialism and racism, um, 
people in the past have effectively used the law to basically challenge that institution um, and basically work within it. Um, and I'm reminded of uh, cases throughout the 20th century of um, Japanese Americans who, while they were in the US, they would challenge um, those distinctions that were already set in the law between who is white, who is Asian, um, and who is uh, given certain privileges in society. Um, and I think NAGPRA actually is a good example of how um, challenging the law and working like within that um, problematic institution can lead to changes. Um, like NAGPRA in 1990, uh, although it was already 33 years ago, um, was a major step in um, protecting the rights of Native Americans and their, and their cultural heritage and physical heritage. Um, and so I think today, the way we can move forward is basically um, by continuing to challenge uh, the legal institution, um, and uh, eventually we might be able to align um, the American legal system with uh, the values and principles that um, what we value today. Um, thank you for your question. I have a lot of thoughts about this and a lot of examples, but I'm going to keep it brief in the interest of time. Um, I was actually sort of introduced to this idea at the Decolonizing Museums Conference that I think you were organizing last year, um, and mostly from Wayne Modest, who um, I think he curates the Tropen Museum in Amsterdam, uh, or did. And this sort of idea that uh, there's all these sort of objects that need to be used and sort of deteriorate on their own accord. Um, and I think I, I was backpacking this summer and I went to the Tropen Museum and I saw this leather coat that they have from, I want to say, somewhere in the North Atlantic. I, I'm not sure exactly which indigenous region it was, but um, there was a description on it that sort of said that they take this coat out and let the descendant communities burn it every every year or so um, to, as their sort of own way of agency in preserving um, this object through use. Um, and there's not a lot of good examples in ethnogra ethnographic museums for musical instruments um, because there's such poor use, I guess, of them. Um, so in the Penn Museum, I think in general for a lot of museums that have musical instruments, there sort of needs to be a specific person in charge of just musical instruments and recognize that they shouldn't be classified under specific cultures but rather as types of things and there's this whole there's this whole like literature on organog organology that thinks about how instruments are named and how they're classified as each other and sort of recognizes that instruments can make music with each other even if they're not part of the same culture and that sort of different cultures always are interacting um, in the creation of sound. Um, but I think overwhelmingly in the Penn Museum, there's just too many things and not enough resources to deal with it. Um, I'm sure that's been your experience, but um, it's a problem that stems back from donating thousands of instruments, but not donating the care needed um, to preserve them, um, which sort of leaves us where we are now. Yeah, I want to echo um, everybody's comments about being grateful for your being here and your moderation and your questions. It really means a lot to me. So um, the first question was about my commitment in my paper and in my presentation to uh, the ideas of Nisha. And I think uh, the question, the way I understood the question was, are there ways to investigate uh, the things I'm trying to think about in regards to fashioning the self, making the self a phenomenon, and in regards to nihilism, and I would say, outside of Nisha, and I would say, certainly there are, and I'm, I'm, I definitely thought about those and considered those. What interests me about Nisha's uh, ideas and philosophy is, as critical as I was in the presentation about it, this distinction between active and passive nihilism, because uh, in my paper I get into it more, but what I'm trying to do is inhabit a post-dualist approach to thinking about how and uh, how people think about selfhood and personhood, so the, the dualism is usually the, du the dualism is usually like objectivism on one side and then phenomenology on the other side. So objectivism, the idea that all of our values are handed down to us or by and this goes to the idea of inheritance and heritage are handed down to us by objective structures. Well, I have to reject that because I think it leads to this mono, mono, monist myth um, that black people are 
merely reactionaries to objective structures and what the objective structure has given them. And so they're kind of like non-autonomous agents or creators of selfhood. Um, but on the other side, pure phenomenology is dangerous also because this idea that everything um, can be subjectively constructed, well, the logical end of that is that you get conservative behavioralists who are like, well, pull yourself up from your bootstraps, imagine a new world for yourself, Think, get yourself out of this situation by yourself. And so um, I'm trying to resist both of those interpretations to how the human person is constructed. Um, and I think Nisha's ideas in active versus passive nihilism are important because um, the idea that one can be can be uh, active in constructing active in construction while accepting or almost embracing what the world has given them, it makes space for both of those things to exist in tandem. Um, now, I, uh, I also feel like um, there are certainly other ways to investigate it, but I also, I, I feel like, I feel like Nisha, I feel like he does engage phenomenology, maybe not like as a phenomenologist would because it, that's after his time, but he does in the gay science talk about turning the self into an aesthetic phenomenon and sort of this, as, as sort of this resistance to despair, this resistance to resignation and hopelessness. And he, he, he assigns a moral import to, to active nihilism that I don't necessarily assign, but I think he does think about the arts and he thinks about creation and he, he talks about how these things are important in making meaning for oneself and one's world. So I, I would say that he's very much in line with what my participants or my interlocutors have to offer on the topic. I don't, I don't see them as being too far removed. Now they obviously might not be as familiar with his philosophies as I am, um, but uh, I do, I do see some conversation happening there, and I wanted to, I wanted to, to make that uh, uh, explicit in my, in my presentation. And then the second question about um, one of my participants, Davion, said something like, uh, said something about becoming disaffected, disenchanted with the idea of the traditional Christian God. And I totally, I totally uh, get that there are other divinities out there, there are other godheads out there, and that's totally my point, is that th I kept the questions vague um, uh, uh, intentionally because I, cause religion doesn't have any type of stable meaning. The word religion itself does not necessarily construe anything stable in the minds of my interlocutors, and I think that's important because then when I ask the question and they respond to me, they're responding to me under a set of assumptions that tell me what they think religion is, what they think about God, and what they think about themselves. And so um, I really, I really, really liked his response because I didn't say anything about the Christian God or anything, but he gave me that answer on his own, which tells me that he's already thinking about disillusionment um, without me having to bring it up. And uh, uh, I do believe that religion, uh, I, I do believe that religion is, socially is a socially constructed thing. And in that sense, I believe that hip hop does mirror religion or acts in religious ways. And so it's a vessel for imagining new divinities, imagining the self as divine, imagining the world as divine, imagining things, values, and new values as, as divine and sacred. And so I appreciate uh, that part of my conversation with my participants, because they all had a different idea about that. But that one in particular was very interesting to me. So thank you for bringing it up. We might have a second for a question. If anybody has one. Well, maybe we could just hear a little bit more on, on about the second question you asked, which was, which is not, you know, thinking in each of these different points. With a, the world we inherit? It's a big question. Yeah. <laughs> it's hard. What is to be done? Um, I think it's a great question, and it's something that I've definitely thought about a lot as I sort of transition out of doing this project is thinking about what happens next and i there's a lot of like twitter discourse and stuff like that about sort of how do we reckon with race relations and sort of queer identity and there's this whole movement that goes beyond sort of people within that identity working to better their own conditions and sort of moving towards people that have um historically 
been the agents of that sort of of disenfranchisement. And I don't know where I sit with that because it's part of it is like so many of those sort of marginalized communities are the ones being activists and are the ones working in this way um, and to sort of have this power shift back up um, is a strange way to sort of settle with this world. <laughs> um, yeah. I, w I would say, so I don't, uh, I don't have a straightforward down the line answer to this, but I would say that the interesting thing about nihilism is that at some point when you're, when you're studying nihilism, this, this, this phenomenon we call nihilism, you realize that it's paradoxical because at some point the belief in nihilism becomes a value and, and, and you construct the, it's, it's antith antithetical to the idea that there are no uh, objective or are no values which one should ad adhere to. And so I would say that what I try to do in my daily life is just trust that people are trying to make meaning of their lives, right? And that um, no n people do that in like multivariate ways. And we should make space, I think, uh, 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 like institutionally, but also on an interpersonal level for the ways in which people try to deal with feelings of disillusionment, uh, which might in some cases properly be called nihilism. So uh, that's like a piece of like personal advice, but I don't know like on a, on a societal level, I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do yet. I think to address um, my topic, I think like one of the big things out of my project was, um, or like one of the big conclusions was basically we can engage or kind of address this inheritance by basically trying to heighten the voices of communities and like discussions and discourse on um, human remains. But I think more broadly, um, I feel like this conference is kind of answering that question in a way where, um, you know, to, to basically like, how do we move forward with this inheritance is basically to continue to like explore and learn and examine like different aspects of our heritage um, and basic for better or worse and basically, um, yeah, continue to, to understand it a little better so we can move forward. Well, uh, thank you so much, three panelists. Thank you audience for hanging out. We are done. <laughs> <laughs>